Today in class we talked about conductivity and chemical bonding and a couple things to review. You need to know by uh, just looking if a compound is ionic, if it's covalent, or if it's metallic. If it's ionic, then we're going to expect to see uh, a metal and a nonmetal. And uh, so it'd be metal plus nonmetal. If it's covalent, we're going to expect to see two nonmetals. And if it's metallic, you're going to expect to see uh, two metals. So ionic substances, when we talked about in terms of conductivity, uh, we say conduct under certain circumstances. Covalent substances never conduct, and metallic substances will always conduct. So the thing to remember about conductivity is you have to have two things present. One thing, you must have charged particles. And those charged particles have to be able to move. If they can't move, you can't conduct. So that's going to explain the conductivity of each one of these substances. So conductivity is a property which describes the ability of a substance to transmit an electric current. An electric current is produced by the motion of charged particles, positives and negatives. The more motion you have, the greater the current's going to be. And we're going to see that in lab tomorrow. What happens to the amount of conductivity as you add more charged particles? So these charged particles, remember, they can be cations if they're positive. If they're negative, they can be anions or they could be electrons. Okay, so these are the pluses and these will be the negative guys. Metals conduct because they have those delocalized electrons. So remember when we talked about a metallic bond, we say it's the positive um, metal nuclei surrounded by those de delocalized electrons that are constantly moving around. So that constant motion there of those charged particles make metals very, very good conductors. Ionic substances can't conduct when they're in the solid states because all their electrons are involved in the bonding. So we're not ever going to see motion of electrons with an ionic uh, substance. We're going to be able to see the motion of these charged particles. But when they're in a solid, all the positive ions are surrounded by negative ions, and all the negative ions are locked into place by all those positive ions. So we have all these charged particles, but they can't move. In order for this to conduct, we have to do something to make those particles move. We have to get them away from each other. So if we were to melt them, or if they're molten, or if we dissolve them in water, then those charged particles will be able to come apart from each other, and they'll form ions, those cations and those anions. And since they're in a liquid state, they'll be able to move around each other, and they will conduct. I showed you this little video again. Let's see if we can get it to go. Sodium fluoride crystals are held together by attractive forces between the positively charged sodium and negatively charged chloride ions. When a crystal of sodium chloride is placed into water, the hydrogen ends of polar water molecules attract the negatively charged chloride ions and gradually surround them. Likewise, the oxygen ends of water molecules are attracted to and surround the positively charged sodium ions. The hydrated ions drift away into the solution, allowing new water molecules to surround newly exposed ions. Gradually, the entire crystal dissociates into solution. So we're going to look at that difference between dissociation and dissolving. Uh, substances can dissolve, or they can dissolve and dissociate. And we can check for that by checking the conductivity. So covalent substances have no charged particles, and you need to know why. And the reason is, is that a covalent bond is formed between two nonmetal atoms that are sharing electrons. So if we have nitrogen and we have oxygen, they're both nonmetals, we know that they're connected by a covalent bond. Hydrogen and hydrogen are both nonmetals, they have to be con uh, connected by a covalent bond. So they share those electrons, they, n neither one of them takes the electron from the other, so no, no ions will ever be um, formed. So they're never going to conduct under any circumstances, whether they're solid, whether you melt them, or whether you dissolve them in water, they're not going to conduct. 
Why don't they, they conduct? Because they don't have charged particles. So electrolytes, though, are um, substances that when you do dissolve them in water, they can conduct electricity, and we have three different types. We have acids, and we know that acid is um, an electrolyte, or acid is an acid because we're looking for hydrogen in the first position. So it could be hydrogen plus some nonmetal, or it could be hydrogen plus a polyatomic ion. And the second uh, type of electrolyte is a base. And we'll know if it's a base or not by looking for that hydroxide at the end, so that OH minus. Uh, so things like uh, sodium hydroxide, which is a metal ion with a base, uh, calcium hydroxide, which is another metal ion with a base. But we know it's a base because we're looking for this um, hydroxide group at the end. And then salts. So anytime you have a metal with anybody in the group 17, which we said were the halogens, and that word halogen means salt former. So anytime you have a metal plus um, the nonmetal in group 17. So we know sodium chloride, uh, potassium fluoride, um, calcium, not calcium, let's do, yeah, calcium will work, calcium iodide. Uh, all of those are types of salts. So ions, we said, don't conduct as much as, as well as electrons because ions are much, much larger. And so if you have a very, very large mass, it's hard to get you to move. If you're something a smaller mass, it's, it's much easier to move. So you know you can um, move a, a dining room chair a lot easier than you can move the table. You can move the table easier than you can move the refrigerator because it has less mass. So going back to conductivity, remember we said, However many charged particles can pass a point in a given amount of time, the better the conductivity. Well, if you're easier to move, we're going to get you um, uh, that motion a lot faster, which means you'll be a better conductor. Solubility refers to the ability of something that can dissolve into water or be soluble in water. So we talked about um, solutions we said were solvents and a solute. Well, is it soluble in water? Well, you can tell after the SSR bell is done. You can tell by looking. So if it goes into solution, then we're going to say it's soluble. If it doesn't go into solution, then we're going to say it's insoluble. So salt goes into water. Salt is soluble in water. Paper clips do not go into water, so they're insoluble. Some substances can be slightly soluble. So in tomorrow's lab, in the data table, we're going to use these terms soluble, insoluble, or slightly soluble. How do you know? Soluble, you won't be able to see it. Insoluble, you will see it very clearly. Slightly soluble means it kind of sort of went into solution. Substances that are soluble may dissolve, or they may dissociate, or they may do uh, both. We talk about dissociation, it's like that little video clip I showed you, a substance releasing ions into solution. So when salt dissociates, we know salt as an ionic compound, sodium is a positive charge, chlorine is a negative charge, they're held together by that strong attractive force. When water comes into play, we know that water as a covalent molecule is polar, the hydrogen ends of the water molecule act like they're positive and the oxygen acts like it's negative. Well, the oxygen end of the water molecule is attracted to that sodium ion and the hydrogen ends of the water molecule are attracted to the chloride ion. And so they have a tendency to pull them away. So water pulls the sodium ions and the chloride ions away from each other and now we've got those charged particles in solution. They have dissociated, come apart into solution. So let's talk about solubility. If a substance is soluble or insoluble. If it's soluble, it goes into solution and we say it's miscible. And if it's soluble, it can dissolve but not dissociate or it can dissolve and dissociate. If it dissolves and doesn't dissociate, then we're not going to be able to conduct because remember, dissociation refers to pulling it apart to charge particles, so it won't be able to conduct. If it dissolves and dissociates, then it will be able to conduct. So if it doesn't conduct, it's got to be something covalent like sugar. 
if it is conducting, then it's got to be something ionic or it can be electrolytes. So remember we said electrolytes were acids, bases, or salts. If it's insoluble, it won't go into solution and we say it's emissible. So you'll know it's insoluble because you're going to see something in there. So you might see a liquid with a solid, you might see a liquid in a liquid, or you might see a liquid in a gas. So paper clips are not soluble in water, you see them in there. Oil and water don't mix because you see those two different phases. And as soon as you open a can of soda, the carbon dioxide is not soluble in the liquid because it comes out of solution. Okay, so for tomorrow's lab, let's ignore this thing, I want you to write these prep notes. Uh, conductivity and chemical bonding lab, and you can write these prep notes in your notebook. Here's the materials, distilled water, tap water, sodium chloride, sugar, alcohol. And we're going to combine those substances in each one of your little wells as indicated. So in well number one, you're going to put distilled water. Number two, you're going to put the tap water. In well number three, you're going to put alcohol. In well number four, you're going to put solid salt. And well number five, you're going to put distilled water and just three grains, really. I want you to count out three little crystals of salt and put them in there. In well number six, you're going to use distilled water. And then again, you're going to count out these little grains of salt, 20 of them, and you're going to put them in that well. Well number seven, we're going to use alcohol and 20 grains of salt. Well number eight, we're going to use solid sugar. Nine, we're going to use distilled water and sugar. And number 10, we're going to use alcohol and sugar. I'm going to give you uh, the conductivity tester, and then tomorrow in class, I'm going to give you your data table. But you're going to use your conductivity tester to check the conductivity of each one. We're going to um, use the terms um, low, medium, uh, high, or very high in terms of conductivity. And for solubility, we're going to use the terms soluble, insoluble, or slightly soluble. And you should know what those mean because we just talked about those in lecture. Okay, that's it. I'll give you your data table tomorrow. Make sure you have the procedure and uh, this page written down on your, uh, in your notebook for credit.